you know, there's been a change in priorities in recent years where it's more about regulating uh, the oil and gas sector and, and maybe constraining some of that energy development as opposed to trying to support the oil and gas sector in an environmentally conscious way. So we're seeing a decline in, in permit approvals in that area and an increase in regulatory burden as well to accompany it. All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to another episode of Power Gab, your go-to show for all things Colorado energy and environmental policy. I'm co-host Jake Fogelman, joined as always by my co-host Amy Cook, uh, coming to us from the hot and humid North Carolina, so I'm told. Oh. Yes, thank goodness for reliable power. I was going to say grateful for that electricity, <laughs> keeping that AC running. Um, and I have to tell my generator story, maybe not this show, but the next one. I've used it twice now. Oh, that's true. Yeah. I'm sure listeners with, with your sage advice at the end of every episode, I'm sure they'll be interested <laughs> in, in hearing that it came in handy. Um, but yeah, this week's, it's important to have. This week's episode, uh, we actually have uh, someone coming on from our friends over at the Competitive Enterprise Institute because one of their senior fellows just did a new report dealing with Colorado, uh, specifically environmental permitting issues. Uh, so before we jump into the details of that report, welcome to the show, James Broll. Uh, if you want to just tell listeners a little bit about yourself before we dive into it. Sure. Thanks for having me, first of all. I'm an economist. I'm a researcher at the Competitive Enterprise Institute. As you mentioned, we're a free market think tank in Washington, D.C., although I live on the eastern shore of Maryland. And I am uh, I have a series of reports that I'm putting out about environmental permitting reform in the states. And so my latest one is about Colorado. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, speaking of you know, permitting reform, that's something that gets bandied around a lot, especially at the federal level these days. Uh, but just for our listeners who are sort of a mix of your average Coloradans to policymakers, uh, what is permitting reform? You know, what does it mean? Why should they care? Why is it important? Uh, just sort of set the table for us. Sure. So permits are essentially permission slips that you obtain from the government in order to embark on some kind of project. Um, they can come in a lot of different forms. Um, from you know an occupational license to work as a you know as a contractor as a dentist or something of that sort as a is a kind of permit um, you know various permits are needed for housing construction and so on but my my series of papers focus primarily on the environmental permitting process so uh, permits that are needed to for energy projects or infrastructure projects. And, the, and and so forth, and, and permits issued at the state level as opposed to at the local level or the federal government level. That's just what I'm focused on in that series. But these kinds of permission slips are needed at all levels of government for all, all kinds of different activities. Now, the reason we should care about this issue is that um, if we're concerned about economic development and economic growth, then energy in particular um, is in and infrastructure as well uh, can be ma major contributors to economic growth. And so, if, we're, if we want to see living standards rise, then it's really important that we have cheap, affordable energy because it's it's an input into virtually everything we do. And we also want th that energy to be clean and and abundant, and we don't want to have a lot of pollution. And so, this is often the inspiration. Uh, behind a lot of regulations and permits of, of the energy sector in particular. Um, so we, we want a balance. We want economic growth, development. We want a clean environment. And so the permitting process, uh, it's important to get that balance right, because if it's too stringent, we choke off growth. If it's not stringent enough, then we might get some of the some pollution and effects that we don't like. So speaking of that balance, how would you say, you know, after doing some research into the Centennial State, how would you say Colorado's done with striking that balance? I would say um, there's some good and some bad, and so it's it's a bit of a mixed bag. Um, you're not you, you're not as bad as some states that I've looked at. I've reported about coming out about New York um, in the pretty near future, and and I'd say they go a little too far in a lot of cases. Um, but I've been looking at, for example, North Dakota, and it, and it seems like they have a a pretty efficient process there, and maybe you could learn something from them. Um, but on, on the good side, I mean, there's definitely been some efforts at permitting reform in Colorado in recent years. And I, I talk a little bit about 
uh, the Pits and Peeves Initiative, which was a broader, broad regulatory reform initiative that went on during the Hickenlooper administration. So roughly started about 10 years ago and went on for several years. Now, this was focused on kind of streamlining regulations in general, but it certainly had some effects on permitting processes in general. Um, what I, I like about that reform is that that thousands of regulations were li literally reviewed as part of that effort. I think about 22,000 in total uh, and about 4,500 regulations were eliminated occur according to the administration. Um, now they, they use something called lean. Uh, this was a big part of that initiative. Lean is a, it's essentially a management uh, re reform process. So, so um, you know, this is something that kind of comes out of a, a private sector kind of mentality. And it involves a lot of meetings, meeting with stakeholders, gathering information from them, uh, better understanding where the where the kind of difficulties are and the roadblocks and um, and then trying to quickly implement process reform improvements. And so as a result of, of this methodology, um, there were a number of kind of, I would say, call them piecemeal permitting reforms that will Im were implemented, such as uh, establishing uh, more online permitting, tracking of permits at different agencies, um, reporting where permits are and at various stages, trying to remove duplication across various agencies that might issue multiple permits affecting the same thing and, and so forth. So uh, the Pits and Peeves initiative had some some definite improvements, but I'd probably call them piecemeal in nature. Um, on the on the downside, you know, there have been some there have been a number of changes in recent years where uh, it seems like the oil and gas sector, in particular, maybe is facing uh, headwinds when it comes to its permitting. And I I have a figure in my in my report uh, where I show that the permit approvals for the Colorado for oil and gas wells in general in, in Colorado seem to be on the decline, uh, especially since 2019 or so. And this may correspond with legislation that was was passed that year, which really changed the mission of the, um, it was called the Colorado Oil and Gas Conservation Commission. And now uh, it's called the Energy and Carbon Management Commission. Um, and so this kind of signals you know, there's been a change in priorities in recent years where it's more about regulating uh, the oil and gas sector and, and maybe constraining some of that energy development as opposed to trying to support the oil and gas sector in an environmentally conscious way. So we're seeing a decline in, in permit approvals in that area and an increase in regulatory burden as well to accompany it. Um, and so that's that's kind of moving against the direction of permitting reform. Yeah, uh, I'm sure all Colorado listeners' ears perked up when you mentioned that bill in 2019, because that's a topic we talk about all the time, and it's been a hot topic in Colorado ever since it was passed. Amy, I'm sure you're chomping at the bit to dive in because you have some some experience when, when that bill passed and some of its fallout. Yeah, I was. Uh, I still have the battle scars from it. So <laughs> um, that was an awful bill from our perspective, but it did exactly... You know, it did exactly what the Democrats who were leading the state Senate at that time. That's where that bill originated. It was a they 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 pushed a vote through. There was actually a lawsuit over whether or not the minority, which were the, the GOP, could um, employ some of the oh let's could you know some of the strategy that they did. Um, reading a bill at length to try and slow down the passage of SB 181. But ultimately, the the Democrats, the progressive left, that was a, they were in charge of the Senate, and they got what they wanted out of that, which was, as, according to your paper, James, a dramatic decrease in um, approved applications to, for a permit to drill. I mean, according to the graph that you have in here, they're, they're just, <laughs> they're in a lot, they just haven't approved, they've, they've 
declined dramatically. And a couple of things that I didn't realize, and I and I guess I, I I'd be curious to know what you're you actually can say that 181 or this whole permitting reform, and this is the bad part for Colorado. There's some good as Jake and and James talked about, but the bad part said it's um added an additional $280 million in annual costs just for permitting fees, uh, caused a dramatic decline in actual approval of, of permitting drills. And this was the other thing, enhanced public participation requirements in permitting decisions have created new avenues for which people can oppose those permits. Is that something you have seen in other states? Is it unique to Colorado? Is this just a way that we can slow down? Uh, you can have a third party come in and slow down the application process. So this push for environmental justice, as it's often called, to be considered in, in the permitting process is definitely not unique to Colorado. We're seeing legislation like this introduced all over the country and uh, has been passed in many places. And we're also seeing uh, seeing this at the federal level as well. Um, now, environmental justice, it, it essentially means, um, you know, there are certain communities that tend to be disproportionately impacted by certain negative environmental outcomes, pollution, and so forth. Um, and so the idea is that those groups need to be consulted and special attention needs to give, be given to their concerns before issuing permits. Now, in theory, this this doesn't sound bad. Um, it's, it sounds it sounds like it, it makes a lot of sense. But on the other hand, it's, it's a little one sided. So, for example, if you're if you're building a, a power plant, for example, or or, um, you know, an oil and gas well, in a particular jurisdiction, it's a low income jurisdiction. Well, they're they're likely to benefit as well from having the jobs that accompany from that energy production as well. Um, it's not only that there's negative outcomes uh, associated with, with these activities. Um, and in addition, I mean, there's there's a aspect of, of these kinds of reforms. It's a bit redundant in the sense that there's already opportunities for public participation in the permitting process and in the regulatory process in general. And uh, it's it's a little strange to sing, signal single out particular groups uh, for special treatment um, when those groups are welcome to participate and they should participate and, and their, their input is certainly valuable. Um, but when you add additional requirements that say certain groups have to be sig singled out for special treatment and the the impacts on those groups have to be measured or evaluated analytically, then this can certainly slow down the process and it creates veto points. It creates easier access to block projects. And we just know from experience that there are lots of NIMBY, not in my backyard kind of groups that oppose all kinds of development projects. There's almost always someone who doesn't want some kind of new energy project or infrastructure project or development project in general. Um, even, even projects that are broadly socially beneficial, like just building more housing, there's often groups that oppose that because they have interests at stake. They, um, their property values might be uh, negatively affected by, by the development. And so this just creates a, a, a more opportunities to block projects, more avenues for litigation, which is, a, which is a major problem. Um, and so, you know, it really works against this, this idea of being of, we should be building, like we want to be, we want to be building the country and, and developing. Uh, it's, it's more in the direction of just stagnation and, and blocking the progress in all kinds of areas. And by the way, I mean, it's not just oil and gas projects or fossil projects that are getting blocked. I mean, it's, and these environmental justice requirements often work against renewable energy projects as well. Um, and so if even if you're a Democrat and you're you're skeptical of fossil fuels and you want to see more renewable projects, adding more of these kinds of requirements is likely to slow down any transition toward renewable energy that might happen. So it's really kind of a, a 
problematic to be adding a lot of these environmental justice requirements. Yeah, I was glad I, to see. I, I, oh, sorry, Amy, go ahead. I, I was, I'm struck by just the whole phrase environmental justice. It's not obviously not new. It's been around for a while. But I think about things like human justice, to your point, you know, if if, if somebody comes in and builds something in a lower income community, that community benefits to your point about jobs, uh, property taxes. It's amazing how uh, th there is a power station up in northwestern Colorado and they're closing it. It's a coal fired power plant, one of the cleanest in the country. It's always been a, just a phenomenal record of efficiency and reliability. And uh, the state of Colorado and um, those who lead the legislature and <laughs> sit in the governor's mansion are, I mean, it's going to be required to be shut down. And they say, we want to make that community whole. Well, so they want to require property tax payments to continue because they know that closing it down is going to hurt schools, um, public services, but yet they don't take those benefits into account when they're doing the applications for um, permitting permits for, for instance, for oil and gas or a, a power plant. They look at it and want to force a company to pay when they're shutting it down because they know they're there. They've seen it and they're tangible, but they don't take them into account, at least not in Colorado. They're not taking them into account when it comes to uh, energy development in the state. And that's it's it's to me, after reading your paper, um, and you didn't mean it this way, you were just telling the story. It is incredibly discriminatory how Colorado treats oil and gas extraction versus, or, you know, we can throw coal in there too, even though that's not the focus of your paper. Um, but they do not have the same requirements for other, for other, let's say, wind and solar. It just isn't there. But um, you put it in black and white. And, and again, you didn't, you just were laying out facts. Those of us have been here looking at it going, oh my gosh. I didn't realize how bad this was, especially when I look at the applications for permits. It, that 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 decline is dramatic. I, I have, yeah, I have a kind of a personal anecdote uh, in this in this environmental justice area as well. In that, when I was in my twenties, I lived in Greenpoint, Brooklyn, and a lot of people don't know this, but it's, it's actually one of the largest oil spills in North American history happened in Greenpoint, Brooklyn. It just wasn't overnight, like the Exxon Valdez or something. It was like a, it was a refinery gradually leaking oil into the ground and over decades. And essentially that oil is still in the ground in, in, in Greenpoint, um, even though there's been some cleanup efforts. But um, I moved to that area uh, because it was so affordable. <laughs> Um, so, and at the time I didn't have a lot of money. I was, I was actually, um, it was before I went to college, I was making a go as, as a musician in New York. And, um, so I moved that area because it's one of the most affordable areas. And so people actually, in some cases seek out, you know, some of these areas because they're cheaper as opposed to like the greedy oil company polluting there because it's poor people there, which is kind of the story that is told. So, uh, and just cleaning up the area, it's, it's not simple because essentially what you could guarantee what would happen is the poor people move out as property values will go up, wealthier people will move in. And so, you know, environmental justice is a complicated issue. And again, it's, it's important that we, that we look at, you know, these vulnerable groups very carefully and see how they are truly impacted. But we also have to have this full accounting of all the effects of if you know when we're cleaning up these lower income or economically depressed areas, what are what can we expect to happen? Who's going to benefit? Um, and when we're you know building a power plant that might have some negative side effects, you know there are all these economic benefits that also have to be taken into account. And very often we can just look at people's behavior and see where are they going? Are they going where the jobs are? Are they? Um, and, and very often that's the case, and and we'll see. We can tell from their behavior that they're they're better off when there are jobs and and incomes are going up. And so so it's really all, the whole picture has to be taken into account 
rather than just myopically focusing on one in, one criterion and criterion like you know pollution as opposed to the whole picture. Absolutely, yeah. Well, People's uh, re revealed preferences often uh, say a lot. Um, as we're coming up on time here, uh, you know, we'll put the full report in the show notes for folks that want to check it out in further detail. But I know you issued a few recommendations uh, sort of at the top of your report. What are the just a couple recommendations you'd make for the state based on sort of its tra recent track record? Sure. So one I would say would be to uh, make more use of this lean process that I talked about earlier, which seems to have had some successes associated with it. Maybe that could be just more incorporated in, into uh, government agency uh, review processes in general, so it can be institutionalized. Um, I also talk a little bit in the paper about uh, some efforts to create coordination councils or, or um, you know, mechanisms for uh, getting early involvement uh, from government at different levels. Uh, when multiple permits are needed for particular projects. I mean, Colorado's experimented with some efforts like this, but they haven't worked very well. Um, and I, I think that they these these kinds of coordination procedures have potential so long as um, maybe they're more targeted in scope, uh, like focused on particular types of projects like, like oil and gas or water projects, um, as opposed to uh, just a general coordination mechanism across the whole uh, government, which doesn't seem to have worked as well. Um, and then I would also just say trying trying to address some of these movements in the back in the wrong direction. So maybe scaling back some of the emphasis on environmental justice um, and trying to get up get up some of those permit approval times in the oil and gas sector. Uh, and then uh, the last thing I mention is it can be helpful to map the permitting process uh, for different permits. So basically map out what are the different stages of review, whose responsibility st each step, what are the expected timelines. Um, this often goes on in efforts to create online portals for, where permits can be tracked, which there's been some experimentation with in Col Colorado. So more efforts like that, uh, where you can really start to identify where the bottlenecks are in the process um, and and report data on which permits are going up over time or which where, where are we seeing fewer permits approved over time. Uh, those mapping exercises can be useful um, can be a useful exercise. And so uh, these are some of the kinds of reforms I talk about in the paper. Excellent. Uh, Amy, did you want to leave us off with a few takeaways from James's uh, great report? Yeah. Yeah, one is um, so, Three takeaways from this from from James's paper is that um, you know I, I'm going to give Colorado sort of an A for effort on permitting reform. You know they they tried and they had a lot of good ideas. Give them an F in consistency. They just couldn't quite. They weren't consistent across um, time, and they aren't consistent across project or agencies. Or I mean it. So, so, so they had good ideas. They failed in the follow through. But I, I, you know, Pits and Peeves is a place where they did well, but then they didn't do well in other areas. The other thing is that the the second takeaway is that progressive left got exactly what they wanted on from um, SB nineteen one eighty one, which was essentially to throttle, depress, almost stop, not complete, but de but to um, uh, crush the oil and gas development industry. And if you look at look at the co the increased cost plus the number of approved applications, and you look at that and you you realize they got what they wanted out of SB nineteen dash one eighty one. So those the, those are the two big policy takeaways. And last one, always get a generator because you're gonna need it, especially in Colorado. <laughs> Sage advice as always. Uh, James, where can our listeners go if they want to follow more of your work? Uh, you can find me on the Competitive Enterprise Institute website, cei.org. Uh, I'm also on Twitter X uh, at 
at James Brohl, B-R-O-U-G-H-E-L. That's, those are the best places. Awesome. Well, we appreciate you coming on to, to join us and uh, talk about the, your interesting report findings. I hope our listeners found it as interesting as we did. Um, but that does it for us for another episode of Power Gab. If you like what you saw here, you can head on over to iitv.org for our entire back catalog. We release new episodes every week. Uh, we're also available wherever you get your audio podcasts, whether that's Spotify, iTunes, you name it. And if you want to recommend future guests or future show topics, always reach out to us at info at powergap.org. Until next week, we'll see you guys. <laughs>